Gottlieb. I am the photographer, author of Abandoned America, American Icons, and most recently, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms, Past and Present. And I'm talking with Rabbi Saul Solomon of Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Shalom, shalom, my friends, shalom, my enemies, too. Shalom, everyone listening to this Dave's Gone By radio program of the air. This is Rabbi Sal Solomon, the founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And if there's one thing I love almost as much as I love Hashem, it's a good morning poop. There's something I love almost as much as a good morning poop. It's a good afternoon poop, and then a nice one in the evening, maybe a nice midnight poop sometimes if I get up in the middle of the night. It's so good to be regular. And like most people, most Jews and Jewish men, I am obsessed with poop and toilets and fecal matter. And I've never grown up, and I hope I never will. So I love talking about it. And I also like to see toilets and bathrooms. I'm curious about how people do them. Do they put uh, covers over the toilet seat? How do they do the tile? Do they clean really well? Do they miss certain spots? Well, believe it or not, there is a book, a book about bathrooms and toilets. It's called Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms Past and Present. It is put out by the photographer Steve Gottlieb, who has also done a bunch of other different books. He's done one about American icons. He actually did a whole picture book about Washington, D.C., which makes sense because if there's another place that's as full of shit as a bathroom, it would be Washington, D.C. But welcome with me, if you will, on this morning, the one, the only, Steve Gottlieb talking about his book, Flush. Steve, welcome. Well, uh, welcome uh, to you, uh, Rabbi Saul. I, I, I want to start with a correction. I, oh, I understand that you are interested in this, but it's not just Jews, Rabbi Saul. This is a universal interest. I didn't know this until I started getting into doing my book, but it's a fascinating subject to everyone, probably the most fascinating subject that people don't talk about. I have to say, Lutherans poop once a year. <laughs> They hold it in, they hold it in, they hold it in, then they have a holiday, poof, five minutes, and then they're back to you. So I can know Goyim whereas into the poop thing. But you're right, you're right, it's not just a, a Jewy thing. Everybody has this fascination. Why do you think? Um, well, there's a mystery to it, kind of a secretiveness. Obviously, we're talking about waste product, and we associate it with maybe foul odors and possible disease and so forth. And so it's taken on, although it was not always this way, it's taken on a very kind of private, secretive quality. So people don't discuss it, but when you open the door, so to speak, put in a little fresh air and say, hey, you want to talk about this? Do you have feelings about it? You find people have very strong feelings about all kinds of things bathroom related. Well, it has a mystique or, or a shit stick, if you will. But can I ask, when was the very first bathroom photo you ever took? Because you, you didn't just say, hey, I'm going to make a book about bathrooms. It was a cumulative oh, thing. It was, it was a little bit like that, actually. Oh. It, it was one of those, those light bulb moments. Uh, but I travel a lot in doing my books and commercial assignments and so on. And so when I saw a really unusual bathroom, I photographed it just like I would uh, photograph anything unusual. Well, what was unusual about it? Was the water upside down? And I don't know what. Yeah, well, w one of my first was a an outhouse in a ghost town in California, and it was teetering over. It looked like a three-year-old could have collapsed it. So I found that interesting. And when I was doing my book, Abandoned America, I discovered a couple of abandoned but very unusual bathrooms, like in the old Packard Motor Plant. When a factory is abandoned, everything is stripped. All the machinery is taken out and either reused or used for scraps. The one thing that's not stripped out is the bathrooms because they have no value. So, you know, I photographed those. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a few, a few of these photos and I put them up in a slideshow for the first time as a, as a unit, you know, six or seven bathrooms that I had done. First photo was probably, oh, 1989, 1990. And I heard giggles, and then I, you know, and then I would hear ooh and ah, and I realized, my God, there's an interest in this subject. I did a little poll of my audience, yes, and they said, do a bathroom book. And then I found out, little investigation, no one's ever done it before. So I thought, hey, 
when do you have an opportunity as a photographer and writer to do a subject that no one has ever done in terms of photography and then text explaining about the history, culture, technology, whatever of bathrooms. We should say this is an artistic book, color photographs, nice. There is a beauty in a way to these pictures that you're taking. It's not just a Polaroid in a uh, toilet somewhere in a men's room. You're recognizing some artistic value and the framing and, and the way they look to you in your photographer's mind's eye, or your brown eye, as it were. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There actually is a, an, an artistic aesthetic to toilets, and you don't have to take my word for it, but here's an amazing fact that I learned in doing the book. And the book is filled with these kind of amazing facts. Not that many years ago, they took a survey of all the world's leading art critics and curators, what was the greatest piece of art in the 20th century, the single greatest piece of art. Hands down, you will not believe what was recognized what? as the greatest piece. What, the it Marcel was, Duchamp thing? It was a urinal yeah. that someone as kind of a, a famous artist didn't put his name on it, but he signed it like a work of art, turned it 90 degrees on its side and submitted it as a work of art. It perplexed everyone. What is art? Is this art? I don't know. If it is, it's awfully interesting. Looked at not as a urinal, but as a piece of art. So that was the most important work of the 20th century. I think, urinal. was that the Marcel Duchamp R. Mutt thing, or was that something completely different? Because he did something with a urinal. Marcel Duchamp. You, you, it was him. Okay. I uh, was wondering about yeah. that. And also, it has seeped into our culture. I mean, back in 1972, the Rolling Stones, their cover of, or it was even earlier than that, it was Beggar's Banquet, they showed a photo of a toilet. I'll be darned. I, didn't, I did not know that. Oh, yeah, and it probably was fairly controversial. They got away with it, I guess, because there was no actual poop in the toilet. Well, but then well, they... back around in the late 50s, in the, according to the Hollywood production code, there were certain things you couldn't show on TV, on, on, uh, in the movies, or for TV for that matter. You couldn't show married couples sleeping in the same bed. Right. Pregnant, uh, you, you couldn't, couldn't have any kind of active sexual activity. You couldn't show a bathroom. So you could show people getting killed. Right, of course. So you could show a lot of violence, but you couldn't show a bathroom or anything going on in the bathroom. No bathrooms, no fist stooping, none of that. I think it was Archie Bunker. That changed that, right? That was the first big change, and there, they didn't show the bathroom. It was more of a, a flush kind of thing. It was this, uh, the sound. I think it was the sound. Edith says that Archie is upstairs reading, and then you hear the <laughs> flush, and it was the longest laugh they ever had on that show to that point, was just hearing that toilet going. <laughs> now, well, that was a, a groundbreaking flush. It certainly was. <laughs> Probably a rectum-breaking flush as well. Can I ask, in, in your travels and your photography of the bathrooms, did you ever come across a bathroom that was not flushed and take that picture, or, or there are no pictures in the book, where there's actual foul execrescence in the pictures? It didn't seem to suit the mood of the book. It, okay. it occurred to me. It occurred to me, and, you know, there's some... There's something to it, because we've all had that experience where we wish the bathroom were better, better maintained. I did photograph a locked-up uh, bathroom in the New York subway system where the majority of bathrooms are, are not in use because they were just too fouled, and those that are are pretty awful. Oh, my God. I just didn't feel it would fit in with the flavor of the book. I, I wish you had not used the word flavor. you got to, like, have the right notes in there, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, and there is, I think, a very a pretty famous picture of the CBGB's bathroom, the club that used to be over in the, the East Village or West Village. And you just looked, and it was like, oh, God. You, you get tetanus just looking at it. You know what I'm yes, saying? Yes. The, the only thing I did that was remotely like that was I peed in the snow and took a photo of my own... Uh, urine. I consider it my, my finest and most original self-portrait. Did you make a, a design? Did you spell out your name? I was, I was going to, but uh, for, for, for reasons that are kind of photographic and more than aesthetic, I wasn't able to do it. So, no, it's just, it's just kind of a blotch of yellowness in the snow. Did it come out nice? I think it came out real nice. Yeah, real happy with that one. You could do a pairing with... Photoshop it a little, you know? I, I wasn't going yellow as much as I wanted. Oh. We have in our mind that, that urine is very yellow, but in the snow, 
it's not quite yellow enough. So God bless Photoshop. I cranked up the saturation. All you, all you had to do was drink more sweet and iced tea, like a half hour. <laughs> Something like that. Like 16 ounces of sweet and iced tea. It'll come out, boom, boom, like a sunset. Oh, my God. And you should get together with Andre Serrano and do a like a oh, double yeah. thing there. with the, <laughs> He's got the crucifix so, and the urine. Yeah, people won't know what that reference is, but it's a... Uh, Yes, take it from me, it's a, a very heavy urine reference. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. We are talking with Steve Gottlieb here in the neighborhood, talking about his book, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms, Past and Present. And I just realized that the publisher, I assume it's self-published, but that the, the publishing company is named Privy Publishing. Ha ha. Is that, uh, that is you, right? Uh, yes, that, that would be me. I, I published six books. This is my my first self-published venture for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is publishers in, uh, in the traditional universe and the universe I traveled in uh, were able to get books into bookstores. Bookstores now have much less impact on the sale of a book. You know, it has more to do with so social media and, and word of mouth. Sure. So people aren't uh, buying books in bookstores like they used to. So getting a publisher is not uh, what it used to be. So that's why I decided to publish this uh, myself through uh, Privy Publishing, and I thought the name was uh, had a nice, cute ring to it. Let me ask, since I, I was, or, or my friend Dave was involved in some publishing many, many years ago, were you able to publish, um, shall we say, economically in the United States, or did you have to go to China or Malaysia or somewhere in order to... to yeah, well, I've, I've supervised uh, the printing uh, of all of my books and done the writing and the design. And, and sad to say, we just cannot compete in America with the price in China. If I had published, uh, printed this in the United States, it would be a lot more expensive. So, uh, as I say, it's, it's sad, but the, the Chinese not only are beating us on price, but they're doing a very high-quality work as well. And they're not just impacting us. The Italians used to be very big in the printing. And, and they're, they're also they're, they're pretty much experts in this field. If you remember, even when I was growing up, we would hear the, the song, Me Chinese, Me Play Joke, Me Put Pee Pee in Your Coke. So they've been working with Pee Pee for a very, very long time. Uh, I, I think they, uh, they, they may have. I, I know that they uh, came up with uh, toilets, you know, kind of sanitary facilities, thousands of years ago you know we we kind of have a very narrow view of history we think it began sometime around the colonial era but in fact thousands of years earlier the chinese and the i, I guess we would call that iran uh, and pakistan you know they had come up with with uh, uh, pretty advanced uh, methods of sanitation yeah well we we waited till the colonial era they were doing it in the colon era essentially. <laughs> so it was necessary. Now, I heard you on another interview, you were talking about the fact that uh, it wasn't that long ago when they used to keep toilet tanks in a different place, like really, really high up or something? Yep. Well, uh, explain this. Well, originally the, the, the thought was by the toilet engineers, and that's an interesting subject, the development of the flush toilet, that you needed a kind of gravity flow to p get the water to push the waste away. So they would put a tank with water maybe five feet, more or less, above the actual toilet, and then you would pull on a chain. And I actually, when I was in Europe uh, back in the, in the 60s, because I'm an old guy, back in the 60s, the, there were a number of those pull chain flush toilets. And, uh, and that was prevalent for many decades before uh, you know, before that, going back into the 1800s. And so you had the gravity flow, but they developed a way of basically taking that tank up high and integrating it with the toilet itself, and they have enough power in the gravity flow to, you know, to wash things away. I just love of course, the... we have low-flow toilets, which are saving a huge amount of, yeah. of water compared to what we used to have, which is terribly important, well, you know, because we're suffering from a water shortage in many parts of the country and the world. Now, I, I love the idea also, when you mentioned, of a toilet engineer. I can just imagine a young Jewish boy, 13, 14, 16 years old, Mama, Mama, oh, I, I have a profession. And so, oh, you want to be a doctor? No. You want to be a lawyer? No. Oh, please, don't tell me you're going into the performing arts. No, 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 I want to be a toilet engineer. 
In the head goes to the oven. Well, but, well Rabbi Saul, uh, yeah. you, you know, you may know from my biography that I am an extremely well-educated person who practiced law for many years. Right. And and I, there's such a snicker quotient to doing this book that I have not notified my uh, Ivy League law school <laughs> that I've done the book. You know, when I did other books, I would I would notify them and they post a little something. You know, in the, the alumni, alumni publication. Right. You know, Steve Gottlieb has published another book, and now I just. I didn't want to deal with the snicker factor, so well, I didn't tell him. Well, what kind of law did you do? I did mostly environmental work Ooh. in big, big law firm and uh, and in the government. So it was kind of interesting, but I, I kind of law really just didn't didn't suit me. And it's not just bathroom photography that suited me. You know, I've done all kinds of of course. But of was it a creative um, stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Was it a leap? Because you didn't wait until you were like 70, 75 and retire, and then like, oh, I think I'll do photography as a hobby. You gave up law kind of still in the prime of your working life. Did you salt up enough money away to say, okay, I can go be a photographer, or did you really make a scary leap? It was a, it was a totally scary leap. And you know what they say about you know, making leaps? You can't do it in two jumps. You know, you gotta you gotta leap across the chasm. I've never heard jump. that. I like that. And uh, and I had been practicing for ten years, so I was kind of getting into into my prime. But I realized I just didn't it didn't suit me for a lot of reasons. And and I had a hobby of photography. And somebody and it's a, it's a little bit of a story, but the gist of it is, someone saw my work and said they wanted to hire me to take some pictures for a commercial client of theirs. And, and I agreed to do it, and the person wanted to pay me more than I asked for, more. Wow. And, and I was so stunned, I realized he, if I had asked for even more, he might have paid me that, so I got it in my head that I could succeed as a commercial photographer. I could make a living. Now, what, what the, the irony you, is, yeah. the guy who promised to hire me, he didn't hire me. <laughs> but, you know, it didn't matter, because we, we all have in our heads, like a certain mental blocks, you know, how we see ourselves and what we see are possibilities. And what he did was he said, hey, you have the potential to be a commercial uh, professional photographer, something I had never thought about. And when that happened, I went, my goodness, this could happen. So it didn't matter that he didn't hire me. Well, but when was that? What year, what era? When? That was 85. Okay, see, back in 1985, photography was still a big fat pain in the ass. You had to go, I, I don't know if you were doing black and white or color, but you still, it was a dark room, it was spotty, it was this, it was that. Now, well, yeah, please, say. Yeah, well, it was all, it was all before, you know, Photoshop and image manipulation uh, tools, but uh, it was a pain in the ass, only that it involved a lot of techniques that lay people couldn't master, you know, and usually around complex lighting, but also managing people in an environment where you might have, you know, models and art directors and and sets and so on. So some of it was really got pretty complicated. And so it, it was an era where there was a lot of uh, commercial activity and photographers really could make a living. There was just a lot going on. But for a, a number of reasons, starting 10 years ago or so, the market for commercial photography has gone down. Uh, well, I have to wonder, did, that was part of it. I to do books, yeah. but then also I became a, a photography teacher. Oh. I, I, run, I run a photo workshop, and people come from all over, and I you know, teach them how to do it. I was wondering about that, because there's, there's a sense, and it's not really true, but there is a sense now that anybody can be a photographer, because you pick up a digital camera, it corrects almost everything. If you get the right lighting, the right, anybody can take a magnificent picture, and you don't have to crop it, you don't have to bring in the dark, it just is, you upload it, and boom, it's a GIF, you know? How do you respond I mean, to so that? It's so advanced now that, that most people can't do what I used to do, and still do occasionally, and they, they can't do the quality, but they can do passable. So people are more into passable, and, they, and they're not looking at pictures very quickly. You know, on social media, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's ever measured, how much time do people actually spend looking at the pictures that they see? If it's a naked lady, uh, one and a half to two minutes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, for a typical picture, it might be a second or so. Right, oh, yeah, okay. And, and so, so spending a lot of time and money to 
create quality images is, uh, is not what's really happening these days. People are just into speed. And you still, do you still go through the, the process of framing and mounting your photographs and, and going through all that? Or is it now all also just digital to page to book? Uh, it's generally uh, yeah, digital to the book. And, you know, I have had exhibitions and I do make prints, but less and less, there's less of a market for it. I used to sell a lot of prints. When I did my Washington book, I had my prints in so many, you know, corporate headquarters and law firms and so forth in Washington. So that was a big part of my business, but that's pretty much faded away. I mean, I remember the, the old days when you would have, you go to Rite Aid or you go to Walgreens back then, you have, you're getting a little roll of film that you took with your Instamagic and you have to wait like a week or two weeks and, and finally, eventually you'd be saying to them on the phone, someday my prince will come, some, that's an old joke right there. I got it. Bad old I joke. Well, it went from one week to they had 24 hours, and then they had almost instantaneous. But now when you go, all those instant print machines in, in most places are gone. And, you know, if you if you bring in a roll of film to a Walmart, a Costco, whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, you may have to wait a week or more to get, to get the stuff back. But if you have a digital file, you can go to a kiosk. And do an instant, uh, an instant print. But film is, for all for all intents and purposes, film is dead. Wow, wow. Did, does that sadden you, or like, no, I've moved on? Yeah, you, you know, sometimes you have to move on. Of course, you know, we all are a little nostalgic. I had a very close relationship with Kodak, and and when I was uh, turning to digital uh, photography, Kodak and I had this relationship, and they offered me as a thank you to some favor I had done for them. They offered me free film for life. Oh. I, and I said, geez, that's a, you know, I'm honored, I appreciate it, but keep your film. I've got to move on. Wow. Do you regret that decision? Because there's a certain look no, that no, film... No, because not... you know, to, to be in this world, to play, to play in this world, you have to do digital. And in my workshops, we have not had a film shooter coming through the workshop in seven, I would say, seven years. Well, why would you? I mean, uh, who wants to sit there in a dark room with the chemicals and the, the little tongue thing that you press the thing down in the solution? What, you know, who wants to do that? Well, but people don't even, they don't even want to go and, and get their prints made at a Walmart, you know? They, they want to see it right away. They want that, in, you know, you get that instant gratification when you see it on the LCD, and you can pull it up on your computer, and then once in a while, if you want to make a print, most people now uh, can do their printing at home, because everybody's got a printer. So in your Horizon Photography Workshops, what do you teach? Key light, fill light, what can you teach? Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's a huge amount. It's, uh, you know, there's composition, there's... Uh, various kinds of techniques that you use. There's a uh, flash and other mm. uh, lighting. I'm kind of a, a master at, at lighting. There is. You're a master of flash people. and flush. Come to think but, of it. That's right. I never thought of that. I'm going to have to use that. Flush photography. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, there, there's a subject that many people uh, need to learn about, and uh, and and nobody talks about. But most people are uncomfortable approaching a subject to take their picture. And I t teach people how do you approach a stranger and get them to cooperate if you want them to be in a picture. Most people are too bashful to do it. They don't know any of the... Oh, I, I go right up to the girl. I say, $25, show me your boobs. Click, we're done. <laughs> Here we go. I mean, I'll bargain. That's the line, that's line I haven't used, Dave. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not Dave. I'm, I'm Rabbi Salsa. Oh, Rabbi Salsa, right. <laughs> Let's not make that mistake. Um, can I ask you, was there anything in, in your travels for this book or, or even for some of your earlier earlier books where you were nervous about taking a picture, where you were disturbed by something or you felt, ah, eh, maybe I shouldn't, but you had a soldier on anyway? Well, of course, uh, uh, the problem that comes up constantly is trespassing. You know, mm. you see uh, something that attracts your eye and and it's not property that you may have access to. So you got to make a decision. You usually can't find out who owns the property, you know. So you have to make a decision, and that can be very uh, discomforting. And 
uh, and I've been caught a few times and actually convicted of trespassing a Class B misdemeanor. Oh, my God. Wait, so, wait, wait, what happened? They, did, and, they called the cops to... What was that? that with these people, you, were, you were on property. They called the police on you. Exactly. And the police came? Yeah. You know, like they didn't shoot you in the back. But why didn't you... Why didn't you just run before the police got there? <laughs> it didn't work like that. You know, you're set up, maybe you have a tripod. Oh. Uh, in one case, I had a ladder uh, because I had to climb a fence. So I always carry a ladder with me and climb over a fence. So there I am on one side of the fence and the cop is on the other, wanting to know what I'm doing on the wrong side of the fence. So, you and know, you that, that happens. You were handcuffed there, there are different situations where you don't feel mm -hmm. totally... Uh, totally at ease. You may be working with people who are very uncomfortable in front of the camera. Yeah. Uh, so I can't. You, you talk to them. You talk to them. Yeah. People are people. You talk, you explain, you let them know. This is kind of number one thing. You let them know that what you're doing really matters to you. Hmm. And when they know it really matters and that you really care about whatever it is, about photographing them or their bathroom or their whatever, People usually reach out. They usually understand. They're they're usually cooperative. Not always, but usually. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I I still want to go back to the the arrest thing. When you were arrested, did you, what was the fine? What was your penalty ultimately? Well, it's interesting you ask. No, nobody ever seems to ask about that. But what happened very clearly was I, I got arrested by the the cop and. Uh, and, and damned if he didn't strip search me as I'm saying, hey, I'm a photographer, you know, what are you strip searching me for? But no, he strip searched me, he handcuffed me to the wall of the police station, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then I got a court date. And then I, I wanted to uh, explain to, uh, to the judge the circumstances. And the judge had no interest in listening to me. And, you know, I was saying, Your Honor, I can represent myself. I was a lawyer for 10 years. And he said, sit down. I don't want to hear from you. And so I got the conviction. And uh, then uh, about eight or 10 months goes by, and in the mail I get a note from the judge, from the judge's chambers, and my fine, my check for the fine uh, is enclosed. And it said, on reconsideration, judge, I forgot his name, has decided to vacate your conviction. And I talked to a bunch of lawyers. I didn't do that kind of work myself. Nobody had ever heard of that happening. So I think the judge took pity on me. You know, hey, he's just a photographer. Why give him a, you know, kind of a light criminal record? So he let things oh, cool down, and then he threw the, threw the thing out. He was such a jerk in, in the courtroom, and then yet, that's, that's, maybe, you know what, maybe he saw your book flush. And, and the word vacate <laughs> came to him, because <laughs> that's what people do. So, can I ask, I are you going to... I have a feeling he knew what he was going to do from the get-go. So he wanted to look tough and, and, and nasty <sighs> on the bench, but in fact, he was a soft touch. So I sent him a book as, as a thank you, and uh, wow, you had I his didn't home say thanks for letting me off. You know, I just signed it and said with appreciation. Nice. Nice. You know, you should send the cop a, a, a copy of the book Flush, the guy who arrested you, and just point Actually, arrows was, to the you toilets. You know what I did? When, when, when we had the court date, and I knew the cop was going to have to appear, so I made an 8 by 10 print of what I had done when he arrested me. Uh-huh. And we were sitting down, actually, together in the courthouse, and I said, you know, I just want you to know no hard feelings. And I want you to see what I was doing when you arrested me. And I pull out of a brown manila envelope this 8 by 10 print of what I photographed. And he looked at it and he said, oh, my God, this is beautiful. God, if I had known, if I had known you were doing such a beautiful thing, I would not have arrested you in the first place. Ah, uh, God. <laughs> and, I mean, meanwhile, good for you. See, you have a kind of a zen, nice attitude, especially for a Jew. My God, because I would, I would still have hard feelings about that cop. He handcuffed you to the wall for crying out loud. I don't know, but I guess this is why people, some you know, suspects run and get shot, and others like you, you get a check back from the judge. You live a charmed life, my friend. I'm telling you. Yes, well, there, there, there is something to that. We, we, we clearly do not get equal treatment, all of us, for, for a variety of reasons. Well, can I ask what you might be... Are you thinking of doing a sequel? 
to the bathroom book, or have you moved on? Actually, this whole thing came at me very unexpectedly. I'd never thought about doing the book until, you know, kind of the light bulb went off. I had so much fun exploring and finding these great locations, these great bathrooms, and interacting with people along the way that I am uh, very interested in doing a sequel. So first got to sell the, you know, the, the book I have done. Oh, well, yeah. Then I, I'd like to travel the world because although there's some pictures from other countries in the book, uh, you know, I haven't been to places where toilet, toilet stuff is at the highest art, which is Japan. That is like the pinnacle of toilet technology and toilet fixation. Well, you know. And I have not been to India where the sanitary facilities are disastrous. And Well, uh, they have a wonderful toilet great. there. It's called, uh, it's called the Ganges, I think. <laughs> you know? What was that? And they have a wonderful toilet there. It's called the Ganges. Yeah, exactly. But, but in Japan, you should know this, there is a restaurant in Japan, I believe it is a sushi restaurant, where the entire restaurant is designed in t with toilet motif. Everybody sits on a toilet, their food is served on little baby commodes. I'm not joking about no, this. Is, is this a gag or you, is this true? You need to look this up. There is a, a Japanese restaurant, and, and the food is, of course, clean and everything is pristine, but everything is in the shape of a toilet. It's a pretty famous... That's, what, well, that's yet another reason I have to do the sequel. Absolutely. Oh, I totally, completely agree. I just I'm, wish... Uh, I'm thinking of calling it World Flush. Uh, or, or ooh, ooh, if you can get into Buckingham Palace, you call it Royal Flush. <laughs> you do all the bathrooms there. Well, you have to wonder what the bathrooms are like in Buckingham Palace, you know? Well, if, if you, do you have another minute? I'll tell you yeah. a little story. Please. Okay. Queen Elizabeth, back in the late 1500s, had a godson who was a tinkerer, an engineer tinkerer. Not, not a tinkler, a, a tinkerer. Okay, yeah. Tink, a tinkerer. And he developed, according to, I think, fact, I don't think this is at all legend, he developed the first workable flush toilet. Wow. It was perfect, but it was a real flush toilet. And this was in the late 1500s. Well... He, he thought the key to success in monetizing this great invention was to get the queen to use it, and then she would become, you know, it would be like the celebrity endorsement. Right. The queen sits on the flush throne, you see? Well, the queen wouldn't do it. Well, yeah, Either she's the queen. because it was too new and different, or maybe she didn't like the smell of it, or who knows, but she refused to use his invention. Uh. Consequently, for the next 150 years, nobody did another invention of the flush toilet. Not because of that, but it's like his invention basically vanished from the history books and the technology books. And it wasn't until the Thames River, you were talking about the Ganges River, when the Thames River got so foul that people didn't want to live in London, Queen Victoria said, we've got to do something about this. We need to have flush toilets. Somebody has to invent them and, and uh, invent one. And then all kinds of people came out of the woodwork and developed and refined the flush toilet. Wow. That, that is a really, really wonderful story. It's just I don't understand that queen because back then there was no photography. Basically, there were oil paintings. Nobody, all, all she had to say is go into a room, say that she used it, and nobody would be the wiser. It's not as if anybody was going to take a picture of her sitting on the crapper. I know. Well, people are very funny. And, and what, what makes it even more surprising is you never stop to think. I can't imagine you have a listener who ever stopped to think in a castle, like, uh, you know, where the queen would live. When she'd have a big party, there, may, there, there might have been a place where you could go and, and kind of drop your waist and would go down into a moat. Right. Generally speaking... There, you know, there weren't moats around all these, uh, you know, uh, castles and so on. There's around some, but not others. Where did people go, you know, after dinner? Where did they go to the bathroom? I mean, people have never stopped to think that what people. Well, where did they? What did do they do? Is they would they would walk off from the dinner table and they would try to find some some place that was dark, like behind a staircase, ah. some curtain. They'd find a closet. And they would just 
go right there. And then somebody would have to come the day after uh. and clean up. I mean, imagine that. Well, actually, couldn't they have just take a piss pot or, uh, you know, a, a so that, that they That they would have had. Oh, I see. Yeah. Piss pots, and they would have had chamber pots where people can kind of sit. But So couldn't they have done that? Couldn't... I don't think they would have a chamber pot that you would say at the dinner table, I'd like to excuse myself, can I take this chamber pot and go to another room? Uh, Why not? It makes no, perfect think, sense. You would just find a place. Uh, oh, Lord. Well, no, but would yeah. they find a place and they would take a little cup, with, or would they just... You know, on the floor. I think they would just go on the floor. Say so that I do not understand. I, I just don't get that. I do not understand. But went, if they went into a pot, they weren't weren't going to bring the pot back to the dinner table. You know, it was going to stay there. No, but no, but you you put a big pot in the room, the dark room, and anybody can use it. And then in the morning, the slave or whoever can go and and right. destroy the pot and bring it to a far edge of town. You know. Well, they they may have. Uh, been, used a little bit of that technique, but bear in mind that the pots that they manufactured uh, for this purpose that most people kept under their beds. Right. You know, if you had an outhouse and it was very cold out, you didn't want to go outside, you would go inside in a chamber pot and yeah. then you'd put a little lid on it and it was it was a, like a casserole dish with one handle. <laughs> sometimes, pretty, sometimes it was quite elaborately uh, designed. Oh, believe, considering my wife's <laughs> cooking, it's exactly a good metaphor right there. Yeah. <laughs> and and they're, they're really like kind of works of art, and, and then you would put a top on them. But they were quite small, so, you know, you couldn't have multiple people. Uh, oh, using, using the a, same one. Yeah, I just, I don't know. If, I don't think it takes a great genius to say, okay, let's have a big clay pot. Um, everybody who needs to use it go into that room. And then in the morning, you know, you, you throw the pot in the river or something. I don't know. Just a, just well, a you thought. you throw the pot somewhere. Yeah, right. You know where they, you know where they would throw the chamber pots if you were... Living in, say, Paris or London, you might be on the second or third floor. When you woke up in the morning, it might be a little too cold, and you have to go, so you want to empty the chamber pot, you just chuck it out the window. And if low, uh, woe to the person walking on the street two floors below. Do you, do you, no, seriously, that's, that's what you know. Yeah, well, you, you know there's a, a custom in, uh, in America and elsewhere that when men are walking with women on the sidewalk, they walk on the outside, you know, yes. toward the curb. And there are two theories as to why men were supposed to do that. One is if a horse or a buggy came along and splashed, or a car for that matter, and splashed water, the man would get wetter than the woman because he was on the roadside. But the other theory is that when people were chucking their junk out the window, it would more likely hit the person on the outside, away from the... Oh, oh I was thinking it. Door. Oh. <laughs> you see? So, oh. Yeah, they would chuck it. And, and, you know, we don't... If, if anyone out in your audience is nostalgic to live in the past, keep in mind that they would not like a lot of the smells and other stuff that went on back then. Oh, I can Pretty imagine. Pretty awful. Oh, please. Hey, after, uh, after I have deli food, you don't like the smell in my house. Believe me. Oh, try. Now, we, we've just uh, about a minute or two left with Steve Gottlieb. Everybody, please go check out his book. Go buy his book, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms, Past and Present, courtesy of Privy Publishing. They published it just last year. First of all, how can people get a copy? Well, the, the, the best way is to go to Amazon and put in Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms, Past and Present, or more simply, just Flush Plus my last name, Gottlieb, and that will take you right to it. Well, you'd rather have them buy it from Amazon than directly from your own, or you don't sell it off your website? I appreciate you asking. Uh, I only sell in quantity. It, oh. You know, Amazon is set up to handle small orders, but for people who want 10 or more, uh, whether if they want to contact me, you can go to my website, which is gottliebphoto.com, and that has Flush, and it has my other books, and it has... Uh, presentations and you know keynote addresses that I do and workshops that I do and all that stuff. So and it's Gottlieb the, spelled the usual way G O T T L I E B, which means love God in German. That's but that's correct. Can I ask? Are you uh, Mozart? Yes. Gottlieb was Mozart's middle name, and he decided he didn't like the sound of it, so he changed it to the Latin version of Love God, Ama Deus. I did not know that. Wow! Thank you! 
Thank you, Steve Amadeus. I did not uh, did not really make that connection. No, because I know Victor Borg used to uh, used to talk about Giuseppe Verdi, and he said, you know, what Giuseppe Verdi's name is Joe Green, which, which it really was. But my real last question for Steve Gottlieb is, and I, let's not come to blows over this, but I have heard, and I've heard you discuss this in all the different interviews, that when you are putting toilet paper in your bathroom, you hang it the wrong way. You hang it with the paper touching the wall. Why do you do this? Yeah, I, I do under. You do the under, but yes. I am, I am in the minority. I didn't realize that there was uh, strong feelings about this till I did the book. And, and I also didn't realize how much people favor the over. Oh, yeah. But although I've had a lifetime of doing it under, when I got married, I married an over person. And uh. just, I, I don't want to show off how smart I am, but you see, I'm smart enough to know that in a marriage, when you compromise, it's <laughs> the woman who's right. So I never challenged her. I just said, honey, there must be a good reason to do over. From now on, I will do over. But why were you doing under? Household. What, what was it about under that appealed to you? I, I don't know. It's, a, it's like a metaphysical question. It just felt right to me. The only, the only rationale that anyone's ever come up with for why to do it under is if you have a cat that likes to play with toilet paper, if you do over and they play with the toilet paper, they can pull all the paper off the roll. Ooh. Whereas if you do under, they can't. But you, I never had cats, so there was no reason other than it felt right. That's a, that is a reasonable thing. That is, that, you know, I'm thinking in terms of if it's under, you know, you get all the fluff and stuff on the walls and you're always touching the walls with your dirty, filthy hand when you're, you're pulling a, a piece off. Whereas if it's over, all you're doing is touching just paper. So I think that... I, well, yeah, there may, there may be something. I, I, I actually think that it's one of those things where, like so many things, we develop an opinion and then we come up with a rationale to justify our opinion. I think fair. it's that. Well, what's, can I ask what toilet paper you use, which one you like the best? Well, uh, I'm very inclined toward uh, two-ply. Oh, yeah. They make one-ply, they make three-ply. I have a, a whole section in the book on toilet paper history, which is a whole interesting universe. And, and I think the most interesting fact I will share, but there's lots of interesting facts, is back in the 70s, Mr. Whipple, for those people who were, say, over... 45 or 50, he would advertise Charmin tissue. Yes. Mr. Whipple was the third most recognizable face in America after the president and Billy Graham because he was doing these ads all the time, and he never even said he was selling toilet paper. He would just say, please, ladies, don't squeeze the Charmin. Right. Anyway, two-ply, I don't need any lotion in it or softener. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh -uh. But, uh, but, you know, there's a growth industry now, written up in the Wall Street Journal about two weeks ago, in premium toilet papers. This is, this is one of those accessible luxury items that anyone can afford, but I'm happy to skip. I don't want my extra pennies to go to... Premium? What makes it premium? What do they do to it? I, I think they probably do a little additional softening, and maybe it's a little thicker... I, I don't know. Well, think, don't thicker know. is good. And maybe thicker. it's just a big marketing ploy. But people are spending, I mean, it, it's opened up, it's kind of an, obviously there's the same amount of toilet paper used, but it's snared a very substantial p part of the toilet paper market, these super premium toilet papers, and everyone's getting on board, all the manufacturers, you know, in which there are several, you know, big, big companies. I think they should do with toilet paper what they do with paper towels. Will they have the select size? Because you kind of know when you're sitting down there and, and you've done your business, you know if you need a little bitty square or if you're going to need to use half the roll right there. Well, there's a patent in the works right there. I think so. Let you, I'll let you take the lead on that. Why, thank you so much, Steve Gottlieb. It has been a pleasure to talk with you about photography, about your life, about your book. Well, your several books, but the main, the recent one, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms Past and present. Everybody go to your website, go to Amazon, get the book, and I thank you so much 
for being a royal flush with us here in the neighborhood, Steve. Well, it's my pleasure, Rabbi Sal, and I, I wish you a life of good flushing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if I lived in Queens, that would really work. Shalom to you.